Heavenly Father, we look forward to that day when we can go home, where there won't be any sorrow, crying, or pain. We pray tonight as we look at all the provisions that you've made for each one of us to have that opportunity, no matter who we are, we thank you. We ask that you will give us tonight the understanding, the wisdom that we need. Pray, Lord, that our hearts may be soft and tender, that the Holy Spirit may be able to speak to each of us and draw us near to you. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Scripture says that the Word of God is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It says that God merely speaks and things come into existence. Listen. Psalms 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. I mean, he spoke and the earth was formed, came into existence. So when God speaks, folks, mighty things take place and happen. In fact, there on Mount Sinai, it says as he spoke the law, into existence. Deuteronomy 5, 22. These words the Lord spoke to, to all your assembly in the mountain from the midst of the fire. He stood there and he spoke the commandments of God. The cloud and the thick darkness with a loud voice and he added no more. He spoke the word of God into existence and he wrote them on two tables of stone and gave them to me. So Moses said he spoke that, wrote it on tables of stone, and gave it to me. The Bible says that when Jesus comes back, he's going to speak. It doesn't just say he's going to speak. It says he's going to shout. Listen. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first says he's going to come, he's going to shout, his words are going to roll through this earth like thunder, and those that are dead in the ground are literally going to hear that voice, and they're going to come up out of the ground. They're going to rise. Resurrection will take place. All these people that are going to come forth when Jesus speaks, when he shouts, where are they coming from? Are they up in heaven? Are they in hell? Uh, just exactly where are these people? We need to establish that. We need to establish what God's Word says. Where are these people that when he shouts and they're all going to be resurrected, where are they coming from? Well, let's see. The Scripture tells us very clearly where they come from. John 5, 28, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which... All who are in the Grave. where Grave. graves will hear his voice. So it says clearly, all these people that are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So the scripture says clearly that all the dead are going to come up out of the grave. Let's look at another one. Daniel 12, verse 2. This is Daniel. This is one that he said, Daniel, you are greatly beloved. I mean, he, you, you know that there are only two people in the Bible that it doesn't say anything bad about. Do you know that? That's Daniel and Joseph. So he, he's, he's very much beloved. So listen to what the Lord says to Daniel. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall where are they? Huh? They're in the dust of the earth, okay? Shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay, so it makes it very clear that they are asleep in the dust of the ground. They're going to come out of that. 
You remember when Jesus was crucified? The veil in the temple was rent. Did you know that the Bible says that the graves opened? Huh? Listen to this. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. So these people that are dead, and when Jesus comes and calls, where are they coming from, folks? Grave. They're not coming from heaven. They're not coming from some spirit world, they're coming from the grave is exactly what the scripture tells us. And it says these people that came out of the grave and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So the Bible makes it very clear where they are. I guess the question we need to ask ourselves then tonight is, what's their condition? You know, if they're in the grave, then uh, do the dead retain their senses? Can they see, hear, taste, touch, smell? Do the dead experience such things as joy, sorrow, pain? What, what just happens to a person when they die? What is their condition? Well, let's see if the Scripture will tell us what their condition is. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know, how much do they know? Nothing. They have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So the scripture says that the person's in the grave, they don't know nothing, anything. You know, it's always amused me why, why people want to think that the people in the grave know something. You know, uh, let me ask you a question tonight. When you go to cross the street, which way do you look first, to the left or to the right? Well, some of you don't even know, do you? <laughs> okay, all of you, since you were children, have been taught to look to the left because that's the way the traffic's coming from. And that's great as long as you don't travel, okay? Because there are places in the world where they drive on the other side of the street. And I have been there, you know, and look, nobody coming step out in the street, and boy, right there it was. Just almost got me. Okay, there's people lose their life every year over that one thing, okay? So let's say I'm not watching where I'm going, all right? And I step out in the street, and this car hits me, knocks me down, knocks me unconscious, okay? Do I know anything? No, I'm unconscious. I don't know anything. And they call the ambulance. They put me in the ambulance and they rush me to the hospital. They roll me into the emergency room and the doctor comes in and examines me and he says, this man is hurt internally, we're going to have to operate on him. So they roll me into the operating room, they call the anesthetist, comes in and they begin to give me the anesthetic, they put me to sleep. Do I know anything? Huh? No, I'm asleep, I don't know a thing. The doctor starts operating on me and while he's operating on me, my heart stops beating. Now I know everything. <laughs> no, folks, see? The Bible just says that when a person dies, they don't know anything. Listen, it goes on further. Also their love and their hatred and their envy have now perished, okay? Nevermore will they have a share in anything that's done under the sun. So the Bible makes it clear they don't know anything. We've just gone through the Olympics. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed it, but so many times I see this where somebody who is participating in one of the sports and they win, say, the gold medal, and uh, the commentary will be, a commentator will be talking to them, and... Uh, find out that maybe they love their mother or their father. And the commentator will say something to them about, you know, your dad was very close to you and, and helped you all this time, and, and it's been so nice if he could have been here, and, you know, they talk about that. And then something will be said about, well, he's up in heaven looking down on it. I'm sure you've seen that time and time again. Would you like to see what the Bible says about that? 
Listen, this is what the Scripture says about that very thing. His sons come to honor. He does not... Oh. His sons come to honor. He does not know it. They are brought low. He does not perceive it. No, he, he doesn't know that. They die. He's not aware of it. He dies. He's not aware of what goes on there. Makes it very clear. Scripture says in Job 14, verse 10, But the man dies, is laid away. Indeed, he breathes his last and... Where is he? It says he dies, breathes his last. Where is he? Well, we found out where he is, didn't we? He's in the grave. He doesn't know anything. So man lies down, does not rise till the heavens are no more. Listen carefully now. They will not awake nor be aroused from their sleep. The Bible is crystal clear that the dead don't know anything. They are asleep and they will remain so until the coming of Jesus Christ. The dead do not praise the Lord, nor any who go down into silence. They don't know anything. They don't praise God. It says they just go down into silence. That's, that's where they are that whole time. Well, you say, well, they're in their grave. They don't know anything. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? Well, I can tell you this, folks. If you think that philosophy offers you some hope, you missed it. You know, I have read the works of atheists, agnostics, and infidels, and when I got through, it was just nothing there. It was just darkness. There was no hope at all. I want you to listen to what Christ offers to you. 1 John 5, 11, and this is the testimony that God has, has given to us, what? Eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Now, folks, let's get something clear. Where is eternal life? In you? No. Eternal life is in his Son. Listen. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's simply right there. And if you want life, if you want eternal life, it's found totally and completely in Jesus Christ. No one else. See, Christ died. Did he stay in the grave? No, he did not stay in the grave. He came forth from the grave. Listen to the promise of God, what he says he will do for you and for me. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised he who raised Christ from the dead will also give to your what kind of body? Mortal bodies through the spirit that dwells in you. So it says that same spirit that gave life to Jesus Christ will give you life. That's where the hope is, the hope is in Jesus Christ. It is not. You and I, nowhere in that Bible, folks, does it say that you and I have immortality. Just doesn't promise that. We get immortality because of Jesus Christ. We are mortal. That means we're subject to death. We do not have immortality of ourselves. Okay? The Bible doesn't promise that. It promises that we get immortality through Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives us. Well, then we need to ask ourselves a question. If this happens at the resurrection, when does the resurrection take place? Well, let's see if the Scripture will tell us. John 6, 39. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. So when is the resurrection going to take place? Last day. If you're not clear on that, look at this one. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, 
may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last days. Is it getting clear? Resurrection takes place at the last days. One more. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. So the Scripture's crystal clear that the resurrection is going to take place at the last days. It says to you and I, as individuals, are mortal. It says that we're subject to death and that when we die, we are in the grave. We don't know anything until the resurrection at the last day. That's when the resurrection will take place. Now, this idea, you know, this idea that when you die, if you're good, you go to heaven. If you're bad, you go to hell. Uh, that really causes some major problems in understanding God's Word. Let me show you a few of them. If it's true that when you die, if you're good, you go to heaven, if you're bad, you go to hell, then what need is there of a resurrection? Well, I have one. If all the righteous are up in heaven. Okay. Why not just gather the live and take them to heaven? They're, all the rest are there. If this is true that when you die, if you're good, you go to heaven, if you're bad, you go to hell, then what need is there of the coming of Jesus? Why does Jesus need to come back if when you die, you go to heaven? Not really any reason. Or if it's true, then what need is there of a judgment? You talk about getting in trouble, have someone go to heaven and be there for a few hundred years and then have the judgment and find out they didn't belong there. That, that won't work. See. So what I'm trying to say, that does away with some of the great teachings of God's Word. I uh, have a friend when her daughter was about, oh, I don't know, five years old or so, they went out to the cemetery to put some flowers on the aunt's grave and they got out there and laid the flowers on the grave there. And this little girl, the wheels were turning, and, and she reached over and tugged on her mother's skirt. And she said, is Aunt Polly in there? And the mother said, oh, no, Aunt Polly's not there. She's up in heaven. And the little girl thought that through for a little bit, and she tugged on her mother's skirt, and she said, uh, why are we putting the flowers there? And, of course, this really threw the mother into confusion, you know. She, she didn't know exactly what to say. Uh, and so she said, well, uh, uh, Aunt Polly's up in heaven, but her, her body's here. And the little girl thought a little bit and tugged on her mother's skirt and said, uh, Aunt Polly's up in heaven running around without a body. <laughs> and you see, you, you get into all kinds of difficulty when you depart from the Word of God, folks. God has made it very, very clear, very simple that when a person dies, he's asleep. He doesn't know anything and will not until the resurrection morning. Then he'll come forth from the grave. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So that makes it clear where they're coming from the grave. God promises that they'll be resurrected from the grave. 1 Corinthians 5, 12, uh, excuse me, 15, verse 20. One of the great, great scriptures, folks, promises to you and I change, promises to us immortality. Listen. But now Christ is risen from the dead, become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep but each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits after those who are Christ at his coming. So it says Jesus is going to gather them all, take them to heaven at his coming. Well, when these people are all resurrected from the grave, uh, what are they going to be like? Hmm? Going to be an invisible spirit just kind of flitting around. Is that what they're going to be like? What, what does the Scripture tell us that we will be like at the resurrection? Job 19, 25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand 
at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh I shall see God. Let me tell you something, dear friend. You'll be just as real as you are today. There'll be some changes, you know. You won't be sick. You won't ever get tired, okay? There won't be any sorrow. There won't be any pain. All that will be gone. But you'll be a very real person. How real? Whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. So he's a very real person. How my heart yearns within me. Oh, for that day when he's coming back. Coming back in which there will be no more sin. Ever thought about that? What would this world be like if there was no sin? Huh? What would it be like? No crime? No death? No heartache? No sorrow? Marvelous how my heart yearns for that day. Promises of John 5, 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice. They're going to do what? All that are in the grave are going to what? Hear his voice. So we found out that they've got flesh. We found out that they can see. We found out now they can what? Hear. They're hear his voice. Luke 24, verse 36. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace be to you. Now, folks, this is, this is one of the great scriptures as far as I'm concerned. It tells you exactly what you're going to be like. So here's Jesus. This is after the resurrection, and he's walked into the room there, and he said to them, Peace be to you. Watch what happens here. And they were terrified and frightened. Suppose they had seen a spirit. They think they're seeing what? A ghost. It's what they think they're seeing is a ghost. Let's see if it's a ghost. Let's see if it's a spirit, okay? And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is... I myself, what? Handle me and see. He said, come here, <laughs> touch me, feel me. I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. Thomas, put your finger in the handprint. Not something that's ethereal, a real, real person. Do you know how real he was? So listen. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. He said, I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. I'm a real person. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now listen to this, folks. And while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, do you have any food here? <laughs> he said, got anything to eat? I'm hungry. That's not a spirit. That's not a ghost, folks. He said, you got something to eat. We'll be real people. We'll do real things. Heaven will be a very, very real place, folks. God promises that to you and to me. What's our bodies going to be like? Listen, Philippians 3.21 who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his... Oh, it's going to be conformed to his glorious body. Glorious body is referring to his body after the resurrection. After the resurrection, what kind of a body did he have? Flesh, bones, he saw, he ate, tasted. Real body. Ours will be like his body, glorious body. According to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So he has a very, very real body. Well, you say, is there anybody up in heaven now? I mean, if all the dead are asleep in the grave, is there anybody in heaven now? Yes, there's some people in heaven now. The Bible tells us that Enoch, 
Enoch, the seventh from Adam, the scripture says, was taken to heaven without seeing death. That's what it says. So he's up in heaven. The scripture tells us that Elijah was taken to heaven without seeing death. Fiery chariot took him to heaven. Elisha saw him go up into heaven. The Bible tells us that Moses died, and in the book of Jude it says he was resurrected and taken to heaven. And you remember he's one of those people that appeared to Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration. I have people ask me, say, uh, do you think fasting is of any benefit? Huh? Do you think it is? Fasting? Uh, there's only three people in the Bible that fasted for 40 days. Do you know who they were? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And those are the three on the Mount of Transfiguration. Evidently has some value, right? Okay. But listen, it talks about some other people that were taken to heaven. We read about them already, but we'll read it again. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the grave after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. These people were resurrected at the time Jesus died and they were taken to heaven with Jesus because they are the first fruits of the resurrection. He took them back with him to heaven as living proof of the resurrection. So they came up out of the grave. They're in heaven. So there, yes, there's people in heaven. But the vast majority of people are waiting, waiting for Jesus to come back. And when he comes back, he's going to shout. And all the graves are going to open. And Jesus is going to call them forth from the grave. You say, well, Brother Cox, uh, what about the thief on the cross? What about him? Didn't he go to heaven that day? Well, let's see what the scripture says to us. Luke 23, 42. You remember? Speaking to Jesus, he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you comest into your kingdom. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You say, well, that sounds like he went to heaven that day. That's what that text says. That's what that text says. I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That is what that text says. The problem with that text is the comma is out of place. Now, folks, there is nothing inspired about punctuation. Punctuation was put into the scripture by the medieval church. It was not something that was in the original language, okay? The problem is here. I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. That sounds like he went to paradise that day, and if that's the way that text was, that would be right. But the problem is that comma, after you, belongs after today. Okay? If you put it there, it reads completely different. So let's put it there and see how it reads. So you want to watch this very carefully because this is what happens. Okay, we just moved it. Simply moved it over there to after today. Now let's read it. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. See, totally different meaning. That first text saying he went to heaven that day. This text is saying on this day that it doesn't look like I have a kingdom. On this day that they plucked my beard. On this day that they have uh, put a crown of thorns on my head. On this day that it doesn't look like I have a kingdom. On this day, I'm promising you, you will be with me in heaven. That's what that text actually should read. Uh, you say, Brother Cox, that's pretty weak. Uh, I believe it's true, but I believe it's weak also. So if you just hang on, we'll make it much stronger, all right? You remember, he's crucified between two thieves. You remember, they've gone out there they found that Jesus is dead. Listen carefully. 
John 19, 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day, that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath. Now, folks, this Sabbath, as it says, is a high day. For that Sabbath was a high day, all right? The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, they might be taken away. So this is a, a high day. It's a high day because the weekly Sabbath and the annual Sabbath are falling on the same day. That's what makes it a high day, okay? So it's a high day. And uh, they don't want their bodies out there over the Sabbath. So they've asked that their legs might be broken, they might be taken away. Now I told you, crucifixion, it puts the person's body in a place that the only way they can inhale is by pushing up with their legs and that way gets enough there because when all the weight is thrown on their arms, they can exhale, but they can't inhale. And the only way they can inhale is by pushing up with their legs. So to break their legs puts them in a place that they can't push up with it, and thus they'll suffocate. Although this takes some time. This doesn't hap happen quickly. This is, not, this is not like a lethal injection, or it's not like the electric chair. Understand that. This is a, it takes a period of time for this to happen. So it says that their legs might be broken, they might be taken away. Then the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. They broke their legs. Of course, when they came to Jesus, his leg, he was dead already. What I'm trying to get across to you, this is happening late, late Friday afternoon. The sun's about to set. I'm trying to tell you the thief didn't die that day. He didn't die that day because the sun was setting. That became the end of the day, all right? Secondly, Jesus did. They buried him. Mary Magdalene has gotten to the tomb before anybody else. In fact, the Scripture says she's gotten there while it's still dark, right? When she gets there, the stone's rolled away. And she looks in, and the body of Jesus is gone. And as she turns around, it's dark, folks. It's not the sun hasn't come up. It says she got there while it was still dark. The sun hadn't come up yet. And in the twilight of dawn, she can see the figure of somebody over there. But not only is it dark, she's crying. So she can't see very well. And she thinks that that individual she sees there is the gardener. And so she speaks to him and says, if you've taken my Lord's body somewhere, tell me what you've done with it, and I'll take care of it. And Jesus speaks to her, calls her by name, and when he calls her by name, she recognizes him. And she runs, and she's going to hug him. Watch what happens. John 20, verse 17. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet, what? I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. What I'm telling you is Jesus didn't go to heaven that day. He didn't go to heaven that day. What he was telling that thief is he was saying, listen, on this day that it doesn't look like I have a kingdom, I'm promising you, you'll have a place in my kingdom. That's what Jesus was saying to him. Well, you say, but Brother Cox, didn't Paul say something about going to heaven? Didn't Paul say something about going to heaven when he died? I have a lot of people that read that. Uh, let's read the text, folks. This is what it says. 1 2 Corinthians 5, 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So they say, oh, that just simply means that uh, when you die, you're immediately present with the Lord. Now, folks, I have mentioned night after night, this Bible will be consistent, okay? Do you understand the basis of inspiration? The first five books of your Bible were written by Moses. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That was all written by Moses. That's called the Pentateuch. That became the basis of inspiration. 
And so when the book of Joshua came along, it had to agree with what Moses said. Okay? And every book thereafter had to agree with the other one. That's the basis of inspiration. So what I'm trying to tell you is that Moses and Paul won't disagree. Okay? And Paul and Jeremiah won't disagree. And Jeremiah and John won't disagree. It'll harmonize all the way through. And Paul will not speak out of two sides of his mouth. Understand, Paul will not do that. Paul will not say one thing one place and something else some other place. So listen to what Paul has to say. He said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Did he in his mind think that that meant when he died he was going to go straight to heaven? Is that what he thought? Well, let's see if he thinks that. Second Timothy 4, 7. Paul, this is Paul speaking. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Is he confident? Absolutely. He said, I've fought a good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me. There's what? Laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, listen, folks, will give me on that day. Going to give me on that day. When is that day? And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul understood clearly that when he died, there was no such thing as time. You understand what I mean by that? To that person who died 6,000 years ago and that person who died today, it will seem only like that and Jesus will come. There is no time in death. And Paul understood that clearly. He knew, close his eyes in sleep and the very next moment to him, Jesus will be here. That's the marvelous thing. To your loved ones, my loved ones who have died, close their eyes in death. It will seem to them only like a moment and they'll open their eyes and see Jesus come. That's what Paul understood. That's what Paul believed. Nowhere in the scripture does it say that the soul is immortal just doesn't say that, folks. In fact, it says the opposite. Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall what? Shall die. No, we're not immortal. We don't have an immortal soul. Says the soul that sins is going to die. That's part of the consequence of sin. Jesus gave us marvelous hope in the resurrection. John eleven twenty five. 25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may, what? Though he may die, he shall live. Okay? Daniel. Daniel that God gave that promise to him, you know, said all those that are asleep in the dust shall awake and come forth. Talking to Daniel himself, God is talking to Daniel. And listen to what he says to this ancient man, marvelous individual. But you, it's Daniel, but you, Daniel, go your way till the end, for you shall rest and will, what? Arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. He said, Daniel, you're going to close your eyes in death. Go to sleep, Daniel, and rest. And at the end, you're going to arise, come forth. That's promised to every one of us here. I have people say to me, oh, Brother Cox, I hope I can live to see Jesus come. I really like to live to see Jesus come. I'm not so sure I want to. I'm not so sure, folks, that I want to miss the experience of the resurrection. 
You know, that, that's bound to be a marvelous experience when he's going to shout and his words are going to roll through this earth and the ground's going to open up. And as it's described in the body, the bones are going to form back. You ever read about them bones and bones and dry bones in Ezekiel? It says they're all going to form back and it says the flesh is going to come on those bones and then the sinew and then the skin. And then it says the Spirit of God is going to enter into that person and they're going to live and they're going to come back to life. That must be a marvelous experience. I'm not sure I want to miss that. When he's going to call all, all of his people forth from the grave, they'll come forth new in Christ Jesus. Behold, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. That's marvelous. It's going to be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. It's going to sound. For the trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. All of us going to be changed. This mortal shall put on immortality. Did you know? Did you know that the scripture not only tells you that the dead are going to come out of the grave, but did you, did you know that the scripture tells you exactly what Jesus is going to say? Did you know that? It tells you exactly what he's going to say when he comes. This is what he'll say here in Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live together with my dead body, they shall arise. And these are the words that he'll say. Awake! And sing, you who, do, you who dwell in the dust, for your dew is like the dew of herbs. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to shout out across this whole earth, Awake and sing! And boy, all those people that are in the ground, they're going to come out of that grave singing. So what's going to come out of there singing the praises of God. Not only are they going to come out singing, it says the earth shall cast out her what? Dead. You better believe they're going to come out of the ground singing. Do you know what they're going to be singing? Hmm? Oh, they're going to sing those words in Corinthians. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, death, where is thy victory? Singing, coming forth from the grave. That is promised to every individual that has given their heart to Jesus Christ. You tonight can have eternal life in Christ Jesus simply by reaching out in faith and accepting Oh, oh, what a glorious day that will be.